Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you today virtually. I wish I could be there in person, but I'm delighted to have an opportunity to share with you some of the science we've been working on in the laboratory concerning CRISPR biology and uh, our path to genome engineering, and also where I see this technology going in the future. I think that although I've worked on RNA for a long time, it's been uh, true that uh, ever since the discovery of the structure of DNA, Scientists have been thinking about how to manipulate the sequence of genomes in, in cells. How do we make precise and accurate changes? And imagine being able to do that so precisely that a single base pair in the genome of a cell could be altered accurately. And uh, I, this was not something I had ever worked on in, in my lab, but it was through a process of studying the way that bacteria fight viral infection that I and my colleagues came across a system that could be harnessed as a technology for exactly that purpose. Bacteria have to fight off viruses in their environments uh, all the time, and as a result, they've been able to evolve a series of, of mechanisms for defending themselves against phage. And one of them that came to my attention a f about almost 10 years ago uh, in my discussions with a colleague at Berkeley, Jill Banfield, is a system known as CRISPR which involves a series of repetitive sequences in a bacterial genome, uh, shown in this picture as the circular black uh, molecule. And these, the remarkable thing about these DNA repeats is that they flank sequences that come from viruses. And these are typically short sequences of about 30 to 40 base pairs in length. And so this is really a way that cells are able to maintain a genetic record of of bacteria, of, ba of uh, viruses that have infected these bacteria over time. And not only that, to transmit that genetic record to future uh, generations of bacteria. So in 2005, uh, several laboratories identified the fact that, that sequences coming from viruses were encoded in these CRISPR arrays. And they wondered whether these might represent a, 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 some sort of adaptive immune system partly because in addition to the arrays were CRISPR-associated or Cas genes in, that were uh, located nearby in the genome. So it really had the look of a, of a conserved pathway in bacteria. So what emerged in the next few years uh, was the observation that bacteria that have one or more CRISPR arrays with the associated genes have the ability to detect foreign DNA that gets into the cell, in this picture shown as a virus injecting its DNA into the cell, and to uh, acquire s short bits of those DNA sequences, integrate them into the CRISPR array in such a way that they, they can be uh, produced as RNA copies that are assembled with Cas proteins to form protein RNA targeting or surveillance complexes that can search through the cell looking for viral DNA sequences that match the sequences of these uh, RNA transcripts. And when that occurs, these complexes can recognize the viral DNA, bind to it, cut it, and then hand it off to enzymes that will ultimately degrade it in the cell. So a very nice way that bacteria can adapt to their viral invaders. In, uh, so we began to study this system partly because I've had a long-standing interest in the way that RNA controls gene expression in, in cells, and in particular in figuring out how uh, RNA can be used to recognize other types of nucleic acids, uh, in this case uh, DNA. And so we were studying this, and this led to a wonderful collaboration with a colleague, Emmanuelle Charpentier, in her laboratory that led to the identification of the uh, biochemical activity of an enzyme called Cas9, which is part of a bacterial CRISPR system in certain types of bacteria. And our studies, uh, carried out by Martin Jinek in my laboratory at Berkeley and Christoph Chylinski in Emmanuel's uh, lab in Europe, showed that the Cas9 protein, which is the blue uh, blobby molecule in this cartoon, is an amazing enzyme that has the ability to bind double-stranded DNA at sequences that match a 20-nucleotide sequence in uh, an RNA molecule. In this cartoon, uh, shown as the, the black line with the, the box on the 5' end that is responsible for base pairing with 
a 20 uh, nucleotide segment of DNA. And what Martin and Christoph found out was that this reaction in bacteria requires a second RNA molecule called tracer, the red molecule in this picture, that forms an interaction with the end of the CRISPR RNA, allowing the Cas9 protein to bind. And it's that dual RNA-guided protein that is the functional unit of CRISPR immunity in bacteria that have this particular type of, of CRISPR system. And so with that biochemical understanding, we then figured out that we could actually simplify the system relative to what nature has done by connecting the two RNA molecules to create a single guide form of the RNA in which both the Cas9 binding capability and the DNA targeting sequence were contained within the same transcript. So this created a, a simpler two-component system, a single protein and a single guide RNA that allowed this is the, uh, the protein to be programmed quite easily to recognize different uh, DNA sequences and generate a double-stranded DNA break. And just to show you what we understand currently about how this works, this is a 3D printed model of the Cas9 protein in white in this, in this model, uh, holding on to its guide RNA, the orange molecule, and recognizing a double-stranded DNA. And what you can see here is that when that recognition occurs, this protein unwinds the DNA to allow RNA hybridization with one side of the DNA helix. So there's an orange-blue hybrid uh, helix in the center of the protein, and this displaces the, uh, the, one of the strands of the DNA, and furthermore, positions two chemical active sites in the protein such that they can create a blunt uh, double-stranded break in the DNA. So for us, this was really the point in the project when we realized that uh, by understanding how this protein works, it could actually be harnessed as an exciting technology for genome editing. And it might seem like a bit of a, a, a stretch here, but I, I, I think what I want to show you on the next uh, couple of slides is that it was really the work that had gone on in very, uh, very different areas of science in parallel with what we were doing in the CRISPR system that led to this, uh, this intersection. And so what many labs had recognized over the last uh, uh, two or three decades or so is that in plant and animal cells, the cells have the ability to repair double-stranded breaks in their genomes by using pathways known as non-homologous end joining, uh, it resulting in uh, uh, sometimes a small disruption in the DNA sequence at the site of repair or uh, by integrating a, a homologous piece of DNA into the, the uh, sequence at the site of the double-stranded break, which would lead to incorporation of a new genetic sequence at the site of the break. So the challenge was to introduce a double-stranded break at a sequence where one might like to, uh, to induce a, a change to the genome. And many labs had investigated various strategies for doing this, the most successful of which really were the, the engineered proteins known as zinc finger nucleases or, or talons or homing endonucleases, all of which could be uh, designed uh, at the protein level to have particular DNA recognition capabilities. And then by connecting them to DNA cleaving domains, they uh, could be uh, used to create designed DNA cleaving enzymes, or DNA endonucleases. The challenge was, although these could work very effectively, they took time to engineer and to test, and they were, uh, they were uh, you know, quite expensive, and many labs had, had not really adopted the technology for those reasons. And we thought that by using a single protein, the Cas9 protein, that could be readily programmed uh, quite trivially with a short piece of guide RNA, that we could actually uh, use this system to do the same thing, generate double-stranded breaks, but in, in a much simpler and faster and easier way. And so we published this work in 2012, and it's been a fantastic experience to see this technology adopted widely over the last four years for a wide range of, of different kinds of applications. And I wanted to just mention uh, what I see as the reasons why the technology uh, really took off quickly uh, the way that it did. And I think the first is, is the recognition mechanism itself. It's really a, a system that relies uh, on RNA-DNA base pairing rather than protein-DNA interaction. So it's a, 
uh, and because of that, it's a, it's a readily programmed uh, system that can be where the specificity of, of DNA binding is, is easily changed by changing a short RNA transcript. So I like to use the analogy of software versus hardware, uh, hardware referring to the older hardwired uh, systems that required protein engineering for each experiment. Secondly, I think this technology really came along at a time when there were more and more genome sequences available, lots of accumulating information about the role of genes in disease and, and various uh, phenotypic uh, effects in cells and organisms, of course, and so this really was an opportunity for uh, uh, a technology to come along that would enable ready manipulation of that information for both research uh, purposes, but also we think in the, in the not too distant future for uh, real applications in human health and, and other, other areas of science. And finally, um, as I'll explain here very briefly, we understand from our studies of how this protein functions, that it really has evolved in bacteria f to have a, a, a mechanism that allows very rapid detection of DNA target sequences in an accurate fashion. And so that, it's those natural uh, properties of this system that lend themselves to being harnessed as a technology. So I'm going to show a short video here that explains um, how we imagine that this system actually functions inside of a eukaryotic cell, a cell with a nucleus, of course, and uh, we're zooming inside the nucleus where the DNA is, is packaged in chromatin. You can see the, the green uh, histone proteins. Uh, the DNA is winding around them to form nucleosomes. And somehow, this bacterial enzyme searches through the entire genome to find, in principle, a single sequence that matches the sequence of the guide RNA, binds to the DNA, uh, leads to a double-stranded break, and then hands that broken DNA off to the repair enzymes in the cell such that those ends can be fixed by, in this example, uh, uh, recombining in a piece of DNA that would introduce new genetic information at the site of the break. And remarkably, this bacterial enzyme turns out to work very well in the eukaryotic cell nucleus and in virtually every cell type where it's been tested. So we've been trying to figure out how that works. And one of the key questions that we have is to understand how this system is able to unwind double-stranded DNA, something that it has to do somehow without using an external source of energy. And one clue that we have currently to how this works is comes from comparing different crystallographic structures of this enzyme uh, that's been, uh, where the structures have been uh, uh, captured in different states of assembly with RNA and DNA. And what you'll see in this movie is that the protein rearranges uh, quite dramatically in structure as it assembles with the guide RNA, the orange molecule in the movie, to form a channel where the RNA-DNA hybrid forms once this assembles with a DNA substrate. And upon DNA binding, there's an additional a set of conformational changes in the protein that alter the structure further. And then finally, a rotation of the yellow part of the protein that swings the catalytic center into place so they can actually cleave the DNA. And through a lot of uh, experiments that have been done in our lab using uh, methods involving fluorescent labels uh, placed on the protein at different positions, we know that these uh, conformational changes actually happen in solution and are really part of the fundamental mechanism by which this protein ensures that it's only cutting DNA that has a perfect or near-perfect match to the, the guide uh, RNA. I just wanted to show you one slide that illustrates the behavior of these uh, Cas9 RNA complexes inside of living cells. A student, Spencer Knight, in collaboration with the lab of Robert Teigen at Berkeley, was able to label, put a fluorescent tag on the Cas9 protein inside uh, living humans. Uh, li these are actually mouse uh, cells, so live mouse cells, and follow the behavior of these fluorescent Cas9 particles as they move around the cell nucleus. And what we found out from these sorts of experiments is that we can observe changes in the kinetic behavior of Cas9 particles as a function of the guide RNA that they are programmed with showing that the way that these complexes interact with DNA really involves a three-dimensional search model. In other words, 
the protein does not bind one end of the DNA and slide along to find a target site, but instead is rapidly binding and releasing from DNA to search through the genome for a, uh, for a target sequence. Just a couple of things about uh, where this is going as a technology. I think there are really three uh, important areas where uh, there are uh, challenges to the application of genome editing using the CRISPR system. And one of them is delivery, how we, how we actually can introduce these molecules into cells or tissues of interest. The second is controlling how DNA is repaired after the cutting reaction occurs. And finally, I th and importantly, I think uh, an important uh, challenge and opportunity in the future is to think about the ethics of ap applying this system for particular uses, especially in the human germline. In our own lab, we've been focused on uh, doing what we, what we do uh, best, really, which is to think about the biochemistry of the system and how we can take advantage of what we understand about the protein and its RNA uh, uh, component to, to deliver it into particular types of cells. And so we've been working on a system that involves delivering Cas9 and the guide RNA uh, not as uh, uh, um, uh, in, in the form of, of a, a plasmid that would encode the protein or RNA that would encode the protein, but instead as a preassembled purified protein RNA complex. And by doing this, we've had uh, some initial uh, exciting results using this approach both in cells from the uh, human immune system, so primary human T cells, as well as uh, using it for delivery into mouse brains uh, with the hope of eventually uh, being able to treat various kinds of uh, genetic disorders in neurons. So I want to just close by um, pointing out that I think the important uh, question and opportunity for the future in terms of uh, societal implications of this is to think about how we can actually employ this system uh, ethically and, and, and safely for applications in biomedicine as well as in agriculture and the environment something that I'm very interested in and have been you know, deeply involved in conversations with colleagues uh, globally uh, about this. And I invite all of you here to engage in those discussions. We definitely need um, informed scientists to be participating in those conversations. And with that, I would like to uh, thank a wonderful group of people in my lab. I've had the, the great honor and pleasure to work with wonderful students, uh, postdocs, and of course, uh, many collaborators, some of whom are listed here. And finally, I'm very grateful to my funding sources for their support of our research and to you for your attention. Thank you very much and enjoy the meeting.